Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Our paraclete, our comforter, our helper, our standby. We thank you. And we give you praise for all the things that you are set to do in our midst today. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed and agreed. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right, uh, just very quickly before we get into the word. Two quick reminders. One is the fact that Accelerate Conference is happening. Yes, thank you for that excitement. Those are those, the people who have been engaging with the announcements prior to now. Um, it starts towards the end of the year, sorry, end of the month, 26th to the 30th. And we have an amazing lineup of speakers. But in preparation for Accelerate, we prepare our hearts, we prepare our spirits for an encounter with God. Because we know um, that he will bring us a word. We know that we will receive answers to the things that we have been pressing in to the spirit for. So I want to encourage you, we're starting a 72-hour prayer chain close to that date. Uh, we will provide details. And I'm asking that do find 30 minutes to an hour to be a part of this. This information will be circulated on our website, platform, um, social media platforms, and every other platform it is that you typically engage with us. Okay? Uh, for those who belong to live groups, information will be circulated there. So be a part of the 72-hour prayer chain. Also, we're asking, um, we have what we call expectation cards every year. So there is a digital version and there is the uh, fiscal copy. We're asking you to grab an expectation card and list out your expectations for the second half of the year. If you feel like God hasn't done too much for you in terms of the goals you set at the beginning of the year, it's okay to carry them into the second half. And let's trust God together. So please download the expectation cards. I believe that we should be able to provide the link. Um, otherwise, go to the info point desk to pick up a physical copy or to get a link to download. And lastly, on Accelerate Conference, is the fact that it is also an opportunity. Now, one of the things that I do not enjoy doing, if I'm being honest with you guys, and this is home, so I will be honest is to get up here and ask you to come and give. But I realize that sacrificial giving is one of the ways that we worship God. We worship him with our physical substance, our financial substance. And I am an ardent believer and um, I practice it. So it will be unfair for me to know the truth and not to share it. So all I'm going to ask you to do is this. Speak to the Holy Spirit and let him inspire you on what to give, okay? We're not forcing you, but I'm saying to you as a product of grace and as one who's benefited largely from the gift and the purpose for which God has instituted Accelerate Conference um, here at the Elevation Church, of which LifePoint is a part of the Elevation Church. I'm asking you to prayerfully, you know, consider what you want to give during that season, right? And just tag it your accelerate seed. You can tie it to something you're trusting God for, but just be led by the Spirit on what to give. Okay? Um, and then the second announcement is the fact that everyone who's a part of this house, who serves here, we have our workforce family meeting happening June 23rd. All other announcements will come um, right after the word. Okay, please go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 33. But before we read that scripture, I just want to remind us that we're starting a new teaching series today. Uh, I announced this last week, and it's on the Holy Spirit. And I'm very excited to always talk about the Holy Spirit. See, because I believe very strongly that a believer is incomplete without the Holy Spirit. You cannot say that you are an effective believer or a disciple and you do not have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, yeah? And this teaching is really to help address um, a couple concerns, questions in the hearts of 
young people about the importance of the Holy Spirit. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? Um, is it not enough that I am saved, right? You did an altar call. You respond, I responded to it. Doesn't it end there? Uh, one of the things that we will be exploring quite actively in the course of this teaching is how we can journey and maximize the benefit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a gift. He's a promise, and we'll see that in Scripture. So the, the series is titled Empowered, the Spirit-Led Life. Empowered, the Spirit-Led Life. So for someone who's looking for an easier way to reference it, it's how to be led by the Spirit, right? Or how do I become empowered by the Holy Spirit? One of the things that we will, we will achieve in the course of this period is an awareness of life in the Spirit, an understanding of the workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Uh, for those, you know, who have been saved but are yet to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're also going to give an opportunity for that to happen on the last Sunday of this month. So that's um, advance notice to our maturity team and our prayer team uh, to please put that together. But beyond waiting till the end of the month, one of the things that will happen in our services, whether on Sundays or at 618, is the fact that you will be baptized in the Spirit if you're yet to, just by being in the room, by being online. The Spirit of God will come upon you, okay? And you've got to believe it. But that doesn't happen without expectation. You need to be expectant. Um, for those who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we would understand how to maximize the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I know that I have not done something that I should typically do. Please help me love on the person who's seated beside you. Yes. No matter where we get to in the, in the service, if I remember, we'll come back to it because it is very important. So just appreciate the person who's seated beside you and tell them it's great to have them in service today. You're glad they made it because today is an amazing day already. Yeah, and let's love on everyone who's online as well. I also want to appreciate a special set of people, those worshiping with us for the first time. This is your first time experiencing Life Point. Yes, please, Life Point family, let's appreciate them. We prayed and God sent them through. So we are the ones that are blessed because they are an answer to prayers. So thank you so much for coming. This is Life Point. We are an expression of the Elevation Church. Uh, my name is Busola, and I have the privilege and the opportunity, you know, to serve as the pastor here. One of the pastors, right? Okay, let me put that properly. The resident pastor here. So thank you so much for being here. God bless you. We have a time in service where we will specially welcome you and appreciate you for coming. But I just thought to do that ahead. Okay, so Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Do we have it up on screen, please? If not, please go ahead and open your devices. It says, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this which you now see and hear. We see how the Holy Spirit here is referenced as the promise of the Father. When you do a quick backtrack to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples after resurrection, and he says to them that you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And that power would enable you to be effective witnesses, right? And he goes ahead and mentions in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It appears as though that a lot of us seem to sit in that space where when we think about the Holy Spirit, all that comes to mind is power, right? When we think about the Holy Spirit, we think of, some of us, are the, the first set of things that come to mind are gifts. You think about gifts. In fact, you know how it is in our world, I identify as, right? Aha, uh -huh. and everybody has their own pronoun now, God help us. Let me stick with the message. 
So let me just focus on the message. But the, it appears that the pronoun for the Holy Spirit is it to a lot of people. And so we struggle to even first of all recognize the Holy Spirit as a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. And that is for someone here today. You've always looked at it. In fact, maybe because of the various ways we've described the Holy Spirit, it, look, it seems and appears very far removed from some, so many people. Holy Ghost. So when you hear ghost, all you're thinking about is something in white that is floating and flitting around. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the promise of the Father. Now, let's read together, same Acts 3, but verses 38 and 39. If we can have it up on screen, that would be great. Verses 38 and 39. I want us to read that together. One, two, go. To you first, having raised up his servant, Jesus. I apologize. Acts 2, not Acts 3. So the first scripture I read was Acts 2.33. Since here, I apologize. How come nobody mentioned? Acts 2, please. Acts chapter 2. Fantastic. Once you go, then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Can we read? I'm only hearing the life point band read. And you shall receive the gift. Again, see, so sometimes we recognize the Holy Spirit as a gift, who gives gifts, but we forget that not only is he a gift, he's a person who gives gifts, yeah? Verse 39, for the promise, can we have verse 39? Thank you. Want to go, please read it with bass in your voice, as Demilade says, for the promise is to you and to your children. And to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will come. Who is this promise of the Father available to? To everyone. The only condition, the only prerequisite, you know, in banking, um, when you want to give out a loan in, in credit risk, you have what you call conditions precedent to draw down. If these conditions are not met, you cannot access the loan, right? The condition precedent to access to the Holy Spirit is that you are saved. Now, a lot of us have met this first condition, but are unwilling to proceed further. Are unwilling to come up hither. And he says this promise is to everyone. It's not just for the pastors. The gift of the Holy Spirit was not promised to just the 11, not just the disciples or the apostles of old. It's not just to the band. It is available to every person. It says those who are called by God, those who have responded to the call. So the Holy Spirit is for everyone. Galatians 3 describes the promise of the Holy Spirit as the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles. That's in verse 13 and 14. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I want you to continue to note the salient points as we read this scripture. That the promise of the Father is available to everyone. We've established that. But it is available to those who have been called and those who have responded to the call. We've established that that is those who are saved. Now, it is available by faith. It is available through faith, which means that you and I can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit through faith. We simply just need to believe. We need to believe that, first of all, this promise is available, that this gift has been freely given to us. And there is nothing we're supposed to do to merit it because the price that would, you know, precede this gift has already been sorted. Scripture speaks about the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. The price has already been paid for your adoption. Now that you have been adopted and you have become a part of the body, you have become a part of God's children, 
The next step is an advancement, a growth. And it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul goes, you know, somewhere in Ephesus and he would ask a very important question in Acts 19 verses 2 to 6. Please note that down. Have you received the Holy Spirit? So can you please indulge me this morning and help me ask the person seated beside you. Have you received the Holy Spirit? And it's such an important question. You know why? So think about, this is what, this is the month of June. You probably received gifts during Christmas. How many people still have unopened gifts? Nobody. Okay, some of you are better than me. Okay. Or unused gifts. Not because the gift is not nice, but somehow, somehow, you have just forgotten about it. That one you can relate to, right? You saw it, you received it, you opened it up excitedly. You excitedly appreciated the person who gave you, but you really never got around to using it. Some of you can relate, right? Aha. Uh -huh. And so you, it's just somewhere until one day, maybe you're doing some spring cleaning in your house or you're moving houses and then you discover the gift. Some people are... <laughs> Some of us are as bad as, and okay, this is like, I shouldn't say that, but sometimes you, you get something very nice, especially maybe like an edible, and it's fit farm season. You have not entered cheats period, right? And it's a box of nice chocolates that you don't want to share. So maybe it's even the, is the, what you might call it, selfishness in keeping it, and you're just like, okay, I'm going to keep it till I'm ready. And then you forget it because then it expires. When you discover it, it has expired. How many people can relate? Uh -huh. We thank God for the Holy Spirit that does not expire. But that's how some of us are living now as believers. The gift has been freely given to us. But we have left it un unopened. We have left it unutilized. For some, maybe it's a function of a, a lack of knowledge, ignorance. You don't know what the Holy Spirit can do. You don't know who he is. You know, you've really never encountered him. And so you just avoid completely. But today, today is a day of deliverance. Because the enemy has been shortchanging us when we haven't been leaning, depending, and maximizing the promise of the Father in our lives. In fact, Jesus would say to his disciples, I need to go so that he can come. Not exactly speaking to a superior um, person, but recognizing that he has the ability to be where I can't be by my hum in my human form. I mean, Jesus could only be in certain places at certain times, right? Performing miracles and doing, doing all of these amazing works. But the Holy Spirit has been given to us the same way we're experiencing him here in this house at this moment. is the same way we're, other churches are experiencing him. It's the same way churches abroad are experiencing him. It's the same way believers in their respective homes are experiencing him. That is the gift that the Father has given to us. And so, we see how Paul will say to these guys, did you receive the Holy Spirit? This is Acts 19 verse 2, when you believed. So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And maybe that is someone in the room or someone online who feels like, well, okay, I won't say I haven't heard, but I really don't understand it. Because it's not, I'm coming from a background where it, it's the, t the teaching on the Holy Spirit was not exactly amplified. I remember I've shared this before. Growing up as a teenager, I grew up in an Orthodox church, right? In fact, not as a teenager, actually, that's incorrect, as a young child. I grew up in an Orthodox church, did all the Sunday school and all that. And yes, we, we were taught about the Holy Spirit. But I remember things like the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I saw that only certain people or the gifts of the Spirit like prophecy and interpretation of tongues were only permitted to be manifested by certain people. You know what they call them? Or what we, because I cannot deny my heritage, 
what we call them? We call them the vessels of God. The vessels of God. They were the ones that you would were permitted in church to prophesy. And so I remember getting into uni and, you know, rededicating my heart to Jesus and becoming serious with God in my 100 level, I think I was 16 or so, and being filled with the Holy Ghost, and I was so excited. Now, in my house or my home, my parents had a, tra well, not a tradition, but we used to pray. It's not tradition because it's something that was really beneficial, even though we, the children, did not exactly appreciate it. Um, we would spend time in prayer. We used to have vigils every Friday. What is the problem? What are we, what are we looking for? And, you know, because my parents wanted different things, you know, prayers weren't exactly focused on, you know, growing in God, coming to know him more. I mean, there was that part of the prayer. But the, pray, the, the bulk of the prayer then was Oluwe She, Oluwe Bakoso, X person. Okay, so sorry, sorry for the benefit of the non yoruba speakers. God, do it. You know, when you keep asking God, do it, God, do it. You have a need, a major need, you know. And we'll call certain names of people in prayer. This letter must be signed. This appointment must be given. This contract must be released. This, you know. Anyway, we used to have those videos and all that. And so one day I came back from school, recently saved. You know that new birth excitement? How many people can relate? Only, only one person. Wow. Maybe the rest of us, we need to get saved again. So you can experience the new birth excitement. And that um, infilling of the Holy Spirit and all that. So I came home and we were having a vigil, holding hands. And as we began to pray, we began to pray. I just began to pray in the Holy Ghost. And I just noticed everywhere went quiet. So I opened my eye like this. What's going on? I noticed that every, my parents and my siblings were all looking at me like you. Now there's a history to the you which I can't go into today because I was the black sheep of the house. So you, like you, there's even nobody in this family that we receive these precious vessels of God gift. It's now you. And I realized that there was a fundamental lack of understanding. Aye. And I pray for someone here today that you will not shortchange yourself with religion in Jesus' name. You see, because the word of God is very clear. And I've read all of these scriptures to you so you understand. He says it's the promise of the Father to all. Everyone God has called, right? Now, I recognize that there are certain, you know, um, certain parts of our body, within the body of Christ, where some of these things are not as amplified as much as it is maybe within the Pentecostal setting. I recognize that, yeah? And it doesn't make them any less of God's children. It's just that we need to unwrap the gifts, amen? We need to get into the word, See what the word of God says and apply it. And that's what I really love about. And I, 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 oftentimes when I pray, I ask God to please, you know, this childlike wonder that we started out with. Because sometimes some of us become really familiar. We become familiar with God, with the things of God, that some of these things don't excite us anymore. But just the need to continue to be reminded and be refreshed, you know, in my spirit man about my inheritance in Christ, about the things that I have access to by reason of new birth, by reason of discipleship, and that I'm growing and becoming more like him, and that the Holy Spirit, you see, for me personally, and scripture says it, Paul will say to us, he says, he desire the gifts, but I show you a more excellent way, that beyond just the gifts, and we'll touch on this in detail in subsequent teachings, but beyond just the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the ability to prophesy, hey, Papa, how do they say, prophesy, Papa, or what's that thing that people say? Surely, okay, it's not this generation that says prophesy, Papa. <laughs> Let's focus. Beyond the things people say, where you look and you, you ascribe certain attributes to certain people, it is available to everybody. You can prophesy. You can interpret tongues. You can have the gift of faith. You can have everything that is in the Holy Spirit as gifts. But you see what is beneficial. And we've been learning that in the first John study, right? Is the fruit. The work that the Holy Spirit does in us. Oh my goodness. I remember when 
I got saved. But before then, I used to have these very terrible mood swings. I'm choleric and I'm, I'm melancholic. Terrible mood swings. Something doesn't go, I just, I, I can keep you at a distance and just steal in my emotions till I'm ready to engage. You know, and sometimes I would feel like those moments of sadness and anger, and they, they just, sometimes I felt like I couldn't help myself. You know, <laughs> I remember my first relationship in uni. By the time, they, me, I won't lie. He said he's not doing it again. So it's him that broke up. It's not me. I won't come here and say, well, I dumped him. It's a lie. He told me he's not doing it again. And I remember feeling so sad. And I would go and I would pray. We have all these prayer, different prayer points in, in school then. The mountain top. I would go there. I would go and pray. God, why? This is not your word. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Ah, how many of us remember when Pastor Ayer always says in Bible study that all this God said, God said. It's not a lie. You have not heard God on the little things. You want to be hearing God on big things like marriage and destiny relationships. And so I would cry and say, God, no. Is, this is not your will. How can he not? How will he not? How shall he not? You know? And it just seemed like I struggled to come out of that, that pit where I was drowning in self-pity. And my best friend really just could not understand it because she and I rededicated our lives at the same time. And then she, she's sanguine, so she can move on easily. And it's like, well, I said... <laughs> You know, I think about the ridiculousness of my response. He said, she asked me, why, what's going on? Like, why, as in, why are you so fixated on this guy? I said, oh, that he's the only one that can help me, you know, deal with, like, my mood swings. Like, since we started dating, I just really, you know, could easily come out of those. Is he the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and I recognize that people sometimes have, you know, influences on us. They can influence us, help us, you know, um, with our attitude. We can become better people. But they are not the Holy Spirit. They cannot take the place of the Holy Spirit in your life. So until I met with the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, began to fellowship with him actively, those things became a thing of the past. I'm joyful. There's nothing anyone can do to me. In fact, I operate advanced forgiveness. I will make excuses for you to defend you on why you did the stupid thing you did. Just so that I don't enter into offense and unforgiveness. But that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking over the years. It wasn't something that, you know, I met with the Holy Spirit today and that automatically changed. Now I've said all that just so you understand that there is nothing that you consider right now as ill-fitting in your human form a character defect, an addiction, a limitation, perhaps, right? Or even patterns, you know, patterns that, and that was one thing that I kind of struggled with. You see, because I didn't have models growing up as a child. And I want to please encourage, let me, let me rephrase that very carefully. My parents were my models when it came to my Christian faith, but they were imperfect people. In fact, my dad you know, he was he's such an amazing individual and he influenced a lot of things in my life, including the man I got married to. In, the, in a bid to say, this thing I don't like in my father, this thing I don't like, I ended up marrying somebody and I'm really thankful for it. But just growing up as a child and observing certain things, I used to ask questions. How would I be in Sunday school? I'll ask a teacher a question. The teacher, hey, you can keep quiet, just listen. Focus. They don't know the answer. They don't have the answer. You know, I will appreciate if you say, oh, you know what, I don't know this, but when you come next week Sunday, let's talk about it again. And then even talking to my parents. I, <laughs> I remember as a child, I had recently just read the part of the scripture that says, if you call any man a fool, you run the risk of the lake of fire or something like that. You will go to hell. Now, my father had a temper. As saved and as amazing as he was, he had a temper. The temper was for road, was road rage. He's on the road and all those damn old buses and, you know, what you might call them. They are driving nonsense. Oriel, you are not okay. 
You, uh, so one day my father just went and said, fool. <laughs> Daddy, <laughs> do you know that if you call anybody, he's in the Bible. Huh. Let's just say I got the beating of my life that day. <laughs> and I didn't try it again. But these are the things that we're talking about. So we need to do better in our generation, people of God. The Holy Spirit transforms. Help me tell somebody that. The Holy Spirit makes you a better person. The Holy Spirit enables your capacity to be able to receive the promises of God. To be able to live the life that God has called you according to his will. Some of the things that we are struggling with now, some of these addictions and all, it is because we are, well, it's, a, it's a surrender issue. We are dealing with will problems. You see, because we want to enact our own will over and above the will of God. And so we look at our Christian work, especially as young people, and we just believe that it is hard and it is difficult to be a Christian in the 21st century. In fact, it looks like it's an impossible situation. But can I say something to you, especially for Bible scholars and those, you know, who are students of scripture. You will attest to the fact that even the times and the seasons that the disciples and, you know, the people who were getting saved in Jesus' time, the times that they lived was not easier. I mean, it was active idol worshiping in certain territories where they went into. And they had to contend with these things. When you read... Um, the story of, what's the name of that David's son? Absalom. It was when he was sleeping with his father's wives in front of everybody or something ridiculous like that. There was, I mean, or you, you read and you see, just do a bit of research. What they used to do, the temple priestesses and, and just, just a lot of immorality. What was the basis of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? So what are we talking about? Now I know that things are really crazy now, Right? Because then you have to go and maybe seek it out. But now you don't have to. It's available on a device. There are certain, you know, unhealthy behaviors that a lot of us have come into. Not because we wanted to, but either by influence, social influence, or whatever. But the Holy Spirit is available to help you navigate and overcome. So if you're here and you're still feeling that, I can't help myself. I'm stuck with this thing. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is a lie of the enemy to try and keep you under. And you know when you are under, it's like someone who's living at subpar levels. This is where God has ordained for you to be. But you are all the way down there. Why? Because of ignorance, you know, because of learned helplessness, because of a victim mindset or a victim mentality. Some of us, let me speak to this quickly. Some of us genuinely have experienced things in life that the enemy has taken, like he has he packaged and he's using to override God's will for your life. You've experienced hurt, you've experienced pain, you've experienced abuse from the pe people that you love, people that you, your care was entrusted into their hands and you are struggling to get past it. The Holy Spirit is available to provide comfort to provide healing, to provide counsel, to lift you up out of that miry clay and set you upon that rock that God has designed for you. Because he remains the promise of the Father. Given to empower, given to uplift, given to transform, given to refresh and to restore. The Holy Spirit does that. Given to provide guidance and direction, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 14. It says, okay, let me read from 13. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. See that again? The promise of the Father. The Father always keeps his promises. Help me tell someone that. The Father always keeps his promises always he says the spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people can I you know okay maybe I should explain the scripture before I share the thoughts on my heart he says 
it, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. The Passion Translation says, we have been stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. When you think about royalty and you understand the importance of the seal in royalty, it connotes approval. It also depicts authority, right? Approval, authority, stamp of authority. And that's what the Father has done with us here. He not only has called you, You've responded to the call. You, na you are now his. To ensure that as you journey through this life, he places this Holy Spirit in your life. He gifts you with it. It's a stamp of authority. It's a stamp of approval. My child in whom I'm well pleased. Remember who experienced that? Jesus did at his baptism. When the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. It's the same way we are experiencing the Holy Spirit in this season. So it's a stamp stamp of authority. It is a stamp of approval. It says, he's given to us like an engagement ring. Now, when you're on the, this part, I chuckled when I was preparing. I was like, Holy Spirit. I don't know that people really celebrate engagement rings these days, you know, because a lot of people are a lot of the rings. They have been engaged for eight years with carrying ring, rock on their finger. This thing is heavy. It's paining them. They can't put it down. Ten years, engagement has not materialized to marriage. But the truth is, the Holy Spirit has been given to us as an engagement ring. Scripture says so. Right? The, ex the expectation, let's, let's talk about the ideal, not what is happening in our world. The ideal situation is that you are interested in getting married, a guy is interested in getting married to a girl, amidst the bevy of women that he has been liking, decides this is the one that I want. He proposes to her and engages her with a ring, right? Gives her a ring. That is the expectation. He says the Holy Spirit has been given to us as an engagement ring. If you, in, in case you're wondering what version I'm reading, that's the Passion Translation. He says, as the first installment of what is coming. Hey, this part excites me, guys. The first installment of what is coming means that the life that I'm living here on earth, by the help of the Holy Spirit, in fact, I love how Paul puts it. He says that the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, right? Now, God has given me this promise, and I am living on the earth with this promised Holy Spirit as a first installment of what is coming. Just a taste, a tip of the iceberg. Why? Because there is a hereafter. Amen. There is a hereafter. There are better things coming. So if all that you can think about your life is the 80, the 90 plus years, the 100 or 120 max that you will live, ah, you are very myopic and small-minded. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but it's the reality. Hence why we say we, 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 we lay up for ourselves treasures in heavenly places where moth and rust do not destroy. But that's, that's not the focus for today. You know, and says, um, he's our hope, the promise of a future inheritance, which seals us until we have all of redemption's promises and experience complete freedom, all for the supreme glory and honor of God. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to live as sons, to live as God's children and not as orphans. And that is so important. We are empowered to live as God's children and not as orphans. Orphans are helpless. They feel stranded. Sometimes there's a bit of despondency experienced and discouragement. Why? Because they see people with biological parents or even adopted parents who are well cared for. But as an orphan, there is no, it's almost as though there are no ties. You know, you're just, you're just existing by yourself. And that is what scripture says. Jesus promises in John 14, 16 to 18. The latter part in 18, that says, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And he does come to us through the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm laying all of this foundation so that as we start to build on it in the coming weeks, you understand the gift. You understand the promise of the Father. You understand what is possible in him, with him. You understand the need for him. 
there is an awareness that has been created. So that when I say pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know how to pray. So that when you are in your own personal space, having your personal devotion, you're looking for scriptures that speak to you about the Holy Spirit and what he, who he is, what he can do for you. I was going to say something very quickly about the story of Solomon and Rehoboam. I'm just speaking to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that breaks patterns, right? It's still one scripture that I ask what could have been done differently. And then it hit me one day that perhaps, maybe, the Spirit of God manifest as wisdom could have changed something, you know, maybe pressing in and placing a demand like Jabez did. So let me tell you what the story is. Solomon misbehaved. Solomon was David's son. Obviously, God was, uh, sorry, David was the man after God's heart. And God loved him so much that he had blessed him and blessed his entire lineage. And so here was Solomon, who started out well, but ended up badly. And, or oh well, ended up, you know how he ended. And God says to him that he was going to remove the tribes. He was going to cut off the, his, his capacity to be, well, he was going to take out the tribes of Israel from, there were 12 tribes. So 10 were going to be taken off, two were only going to be left with Solomon's lineage. And he says to him, it won't happen in his time. It will happen in his son's time. Hi. Every time I read that scripture, please, you have parents here. Eh? I love the prayer to Lou prayed when he said, just let's go ask God for mercy. And that's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes you cannot finish praying everything in your own human understanding. But as you stand in God's presence and you just, scripture says that um, we make intercessions. What's that scripture again? Someone should help me, you know, by the help of the Holy Spirit. Who makes intercessions for us with groanings that words cannot utter, right? And then he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks to God, speaks mysteries. The Holy Spirit helps us pray the will of the Father. So in case that there are places that God, my nuts and bolts have fallen loose and I have, you know, not walked in love, I have sown the wrong seeds, I have misbehaved, you know, I have been pushed to the wall and all. Spirit of God, mercy, help me. Help me recalibrate. Help me, you know, reorder my steps. You know, I, I can't understand. I was like, God, I know you love David. You love Solomon. But why would Rehoboam now carry that thing on his head? He was not there when Solomon, his father, was misbehaving. And so it didn't happen in Solomon's time. It happened in Rehoboam's time. And here was Rehoboam, who by the time he ascended the throne consulted the elderly, the old men in his kingdom. How should I relate with the people? How should I treat them? And those ones advised him, you know, filled him with godly counsel, as I would like to refer to that, with wisdom. Take care of them, do this, do that. Then he goes and meets his peers. In the land of the blind, he's the one-eyed man that is king. He goes and meets young people. And can I say this, please? Because I know we're all young in the house. You need the Holy Spirit too. to think that youth translates to wisdom. Or sometimes I see how, you know, some of us speak about our fathers. We disdain them. We feel like we know better. Why? Because your father went to Unilag. You have gone to Imperial College. And so by reason of that exposure, you know better. He goes to the young men and the young men tell, ah, no, 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 no. You will whip them. With, you scourge them with scorpions. And, you know, you would deal with them poorly and badly. And you must remember that God, God's priority remains people. So I asked myself, was there any way Rehoboam could have shifted this course from happening maybe in his own time to someone else's time? Was there any possibility? Because God had decreed it that it would happen. Was there anything that could have been done differently? Hence why you need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to break patterns. Scripture says that, uh, what's that scripture now about? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And I believe it with all my heart. Maybe if Rehoboam had, I don't know, 
gone to God, offered up sacrifice, or maybe if he even knew about that, uh, I don't want to call it a curse, but what had been predicted, what had been decreed, maybe he would have done something differently. Maybe. But this, that's the same way you and I don't know certain things that have gone down in our, in our ancestral lineage. And that is not to scare you. That is simply to just say to you, get, be serious with your, 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 your relationship with God. Be serious with your relationship with God. As you spend time in the place of prayer, you break certain patterns. They don't used to marry until a certain age. From where it ends with me, I'm starting a new lineage of people who get married and get married early. People who stay in their husband's homes. You can see patterns. You're saying, no. The bloodline has been drawn. A new order has been released. Or there's a health condition that is prevalent. A new order has been released. You need to get serious with God. Because these are the things that are available to us as believers. As we wrap up, as we wrap up, just two things quickly. To maximize the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. One is to pursue a living and active relationship, just as I was saying earlier. A living a vibrant and active relationship. Not the one that you and I pay lip service to, but the one that we take seriously, Holy Ghost. You know, one of the books that I read on the Holy Spirit, I read quite a number of books just growing up as a teenager. One of the books I read on the Holy Spirit, actually two books that kind of, you know, inf influenced and shaped my understanding of the Holy Spirit. One was Good Morning Holy Spirit by Benny Hinn, and the second one was um, Holy Spirit, My Senior Partner by, I think it's Dr. Yonggi Cho. Those books shaped how I began to see the person of the Holy Spirit. I saw people having active relationships. They can speak to the Holy Spirit at any time. I realized it's not until I go on my knees and pray, 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 pray before I hear the Holy Spirit speak to me. No. That I carry him as I go about my daily activities. I'm able to say, Holy Spirit, I need your wisdom here. What do I say? How do I resolve this matter, this project, this issue, this challenge? You know, he's the source of wisdom. He's the technology of God. He's the creative intelligence of the Godhead. So, you and I need him. You and I need to be in close communion with him. Paul says something which we, in our world we have turned into, you know, closing charge. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know it. So yeah, let's say it together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead. The love of God. Next. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. For some of us, all we, that is all we know. It. In fact, it's just head knowledge, mental ascent. We don't really think about it. The grace of God. Hi. The divine ability to do divine things. The divine ability to live the life of God. The divine ability to be able to do the works of God. The love of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. The love that keeps me. The love that reassures me in the face of opposition. In the face of whatever it is I'm dealing with. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Constant communion. Fellowship. We fellowship with a person. You don't fellowship with things. But in our generation... The, the other way around. We fellowship with social media now. We fellowship with our devices. It's so bad that sometimes in counseling, you're hearing couples talk about how phone is causing problems in their house. Why? Because once one party is on the phone all the time. Not calls, not, you know, just scrolling, scrolling. The children we give birth to these days now, they come scrolling. Because we have scrolled so much that they have learned the pattern. So they come, they know how to navigate. Those children, they know how to navigate devices. The fellowship, the fellowship. For some of us, it is our friends. You have this body that knows everything that is going on in your life. And sometimes you're on a call with them, and especially with females. Two hours, three hours, you will shower. The call is still on. You do everything. You are cooking. You guys are still gisting our men. In fact, let me tell you, that date I went to you. The Holy Spirit wants to be that with you. He wants to be your body. 
He wants to be your confidant. He wants to be your helper. The fellowship. The fellowship. And someone is asking, how do I even start? Where do I start from? It starts with an invitation. It starts with, you know, engagement. It starts with you making yourself available. Remember what I said earlier, the scripture I read earlier, about engaging the Holy Spirit by faith. It starts with availability of faith, recognizing that this Holy Spirit is my birthright. Is my, it, God has promised him to me. Why? Because I belong to God. So Holy Spirit, I'm inviting you to have conversations with me, to indwell my heart, you know, to calm this raging storm, to give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, to be able to navigate these murky waters, to help me know what to do. There are days in my life where all I know to say is, Holy Spirit, help me. And that's okay. I feel his calming presence. I know what to do. Whether my heart has been disturbed or not, I go into a time of worship. I go into a time of praying in the Holy Ghost. Because sometimes English just doesn't cut it. Sometimes I pray in Yoruba if I can, if I have the right words for it. But sometimes just praying in, in the Holy Ghost and letting the Holy Spirit just pray through me till I hit that, you know, it's referred to as hitting the gusher. You hit the gusher, you know, and the Spirit of God takes over. And you start to make declarations that even you could not have, you know, mentally conceptualized. You couldn't have thought it out yourself. The second is to fan the Holy Spirit's deposits into flame. So think about an oil well, for those who are in the oil and gas industry here. There was a time when I used to desire in my 20s that God, all these people that are just dashing oil well, dashing oil. Can they not just dash my father to one oil well, just dash me, you know? But think about an oil well. Somebody's given an oil well and then they have to, uh, you, what's the word? Now, someone should borrow me the English. I was going to say excavate, but yeah. They have to do stuff with it to bring out the deposits that are resident in the oil well. Sometimes you find petroleum gas, you find, you know, crude, um, and these things have potentials. You know, you refine the crude, you can get all sorts of materials. You get even plastics and lubricants and all, just by one oil well. That's like the Holy Spirit. You need to fan those deposits into flame. You start with baby steps and you continue. You continue. You are gifted, you know, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ability to, to, to pray in other tongues. Ability to interpret tongues. Ability to prophesy. You know, working of miracles, all of these things are there. But like I said, more importantly is that you are growing with Jesus. You are becoming more like him. The Holy Spirit is calling out character defects. Ah, you didn't do well there. You know, you need to go back and apologize to that person. How you spoke was very harsh. Sometimes you feel like you're in your right. And the Holy Spirit, so many times that happens to me and I'm just angry. I'm like, but I'm the one who's right. He says, no. You, you can potentially lose or hinder God's work in the life of that person if you don't go and fix it. But I'm the one in the right. He says, so put, put aside. Put aside your, your right. So what I can do in my power, by reason of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, I embrace wisdom and I go and fix it, even though I'm not the one that is wrong. The Holy Spirit is a game changer. Help me tell someone that. So please fan these deposits into flame. Scripture says in 2 Timothy verses 1, 5 to 7, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. That was Paul's charge to, Timo, to, to Timothy. Let us pray, everyone. Let us pray. Would you go ahead and just, again, thank God for the word. Thank God for what he's doing in your life. And ask him for a fresh supply an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I've heard to me, and I want us to keep this prayer very real, especially for those who do not have an active and vibrant relationship with the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, I've heard about your person. I'm coming to know you more and more. I ask that you will fill me afresh in the name of Jesus. For those of us who are already walking with the Holy Spirit, can I please encourage you to say, there is more. Go ahead and say, Holy Spirit, the more that is in you, Open me up to those vistas. Open me up to those depths. Open me up to those new dimensions of the more that is in God that I can access through you. I want us to just declare Isaiah 11 verse 2 over ourselves 
Scripture refers to, you know, the dimensions of the Spirit of God that will rest upon Jesus. He says the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. The Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of God. Can you go ahead and declare that over yourself? That today I receive the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and the fear of God. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you. We ask that you will take over. Take over our lives. Take over our wills. Take over our emotions. Breathe on us afresh. Help us to live the life that God has called us to. Continue to glorify yourself in all. Let God be glorified in our lives. Scripture says concerning you, that you do not speak of your own wise. You don't speak of yourself. But that which the Father says is what you speak. So I declare hearing ears over everyone under the sound of my voice. Seeing eyes in the name of Jesus. I pray for each and every person who's desirous of this next level. I ask for the grace to study the word. The grace to pray. The grace to unravel the mysteries that are in scripture by the help of the Holy Spirit. That we come to know the love of God more and more. The depth, the height, the width. That we come to know you as that promise, that gift. And that our lives will be transformed. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming to church today.